All right. Uh, today we're going to do a couple things. We're going to start our unit on images, and I want to talk um, uh, about that. I, I want to sort of talk a little bit about the movie Helvetica and um, what it, um, what the important points from that uh, movie were, and we'll go from there. We'll see how, how it goes from there. What did you think of the movie Helvetica? Good, bad, or indifferent? And what did you think its significance is for this class? I didn't realize how much we used Helvetica. I thought it was all Arial. Yeah, right, right. Well, Helvetica is the original, and Microsoft didn't want to pay for licensing, so they, they came up with Arial. Or Arial. I say Arial, I'm thinking Little Mermaid, but. Uh, Anything else? Every movie, you know, every <clears throat> every movie has a conflict in it, whether it be a documentary or, or you know, a fictional movie. What would you say the conflict of that movie was? In some parts it was other texts, and in some parts it was Helvetica itself. Okay. <clears throat> it seemed to be Helvetica versus the other five. Okay, and in a very general way, or in a specific way, it was largely that. But maybe if we take a step back from that, what would we say? What was another way to put the conflict? I'm not saying you're wrong, by the way, but because yeah, the uh, some of the some of the guys thought that it was a good font that it showed some like unity and everything, mm -hmm. and then some thought it was too plain and it didn't have enough style to it or personality to it. Exactly. Um, the, the, and you're absolutely right because that's by and large what it was, but really if I was going to summarize the conflict, I would say that the, the, the conflict, the point of the conflict was should font be, what's the purpose of, of, of type? What's the purpose of font? Should it simply be there to convey the, convey the yeah, could, to, to just represent the letters as clearly as possible, or does it, should it be expressive as well? All right. Um, the one that I thought was crazy extreme is the guy that published the article in Wingdings or Webdings or whatever they were. It's like, I didn't think it was worth reading, so I put it in an unreadable font. It's like, that seems stupid to me, but yeah, he made his point, I guess. I don't know, I'm not sure what his point was, but whatever it is, he made it. Um, one of the guys, and again, I kind of, some of the guys kind of blur together. One of the guys said something to the effect, I think early on in the movie, is if you have the word D-O-G, it doesn't need to bark, right, to know it's a dog. You just need to be able to read the letters D-O-G. So he would take sort of the simple view is better. The other person, another person towards the end, pointed like at different words like caffeinated. He's like, that doesn't say caffeinated to me, it's boring. Um, one of the guys made an excellent, uh, there, there are a few excellent points that I want to uh, bring out from it. I, I think they're important. And I think it's important beyond fun. I think it applies sort of to, to all graphical design. <clears throat> but the one guy said something to the effect of, there's a, there's a fine line between, between being simple <coughs> and clear and elegant and simple and boring. All right? I thought that was an interesting point. The other interesting point was, the, the one guy, and it might even have been the same guy, uh, the guy that loves looking at tight more than looking at anything else in the world or, or something like that, um, said something to the effect of, if you're going to put together a business card for someone or letterhead or something, yeah, go in and use Helvetica or Verdana or a nice simple font and arrange it, and it will look good. It will look passable. You know, it will look professional. It will look good. It will look simple. But then the same guy said, if you were to do, and maybe I'm confusing a couple guys, but one of the guys said that if you're going to do a record album now, a record album cover or a CD cover or a poster for something, and you took that same approach, it would fall flat and it wouldn't work. And I think that's an important thing to consider is always consider the audience and always consider the purpose. That's sort of my big takeaway, you know. If you don't have any, uh, sort of the message between the lines in, in my mind was, if you don't have any better idea, then keep it simple. All right? Be simple and be direct. 
Now, if you have a better idea, if you have a way that you think will enhance the message and be additionally expressive and so on, then it might be worth taking a shot, uh, uh, a shot at it. Um, creativity is good, but I think in graphic design, we need to pick our spots. There's time to be creative, and there's time not to be creative. And I think the example I gave is a business card. If you're doing a business card, that's not necessarily the time to be creative. All right? People don't look and hang beautiful business cards out. Not too many people, anyhow, uh, do that. You know, it, it serves a very specific function, and, and you need to fulfill that f function more than anything. But if you're working in another area where you think you have better ideas, then maybe stretch out a little bit. In my mind, again, the bigger issue is always between keeping it simple and keeping it, uh, or making it complex. Simple and complex, in my mind, aren't, value judgments, right? They're, they're more description. Something can be simple, and it can be perfect and simple, right? Or it can be simple, and you say, you know, boy, that's a real simpleton. That's a simple person. It means there's not much there, right? By the same token, some things are complex, you know. Einstein's theory of relativity is complex, all right? And some things are complex, like the poor navigation on a website is complex, all right? So there's both a good simplicity and a bad simplicity, and a good complexity and a bad complexity. What you need to do, consider as you're designing things, is try to figure out that sweet spot of where you hit. You know? in, in some respects, being a graphic designer and designing multimedia is, fine, it is balancing between two things. You know, keeping it simple and legible, but making it expressive as well. All right? On any given project, due to the nature of the project, you might slide towards one end of the extreme or the other, you know. A, a basic site for businesses, maybe the goal is simplicity and clarity and legibility. A site for creative to promote, promote a new movie or to promote a band or something like that, you might want to push towards the more complex, more expressive side. So that was sort of my takeaway. Um, you know, I, I may be the only one in the world, but I've probably seen that movie a half dozen times, and I enjoy it each time, all right? I really do. Um, so I think it was good. And, and the other thing I said, and I, th I think it's important in this class, it would be horrible if I sat up here or stood up here and lectured every single class, right? Why would I be teaching a class on multimedia and not use multimedia? So that's another reason that I used it. I could tell you what those guys say, but if you hear them say it in their own words with their wonderful Swiss or German accents, it somehow has a lot more impact than, than actually just hearing me uh, uh, imitate it. All right, on to images. We're going to talk about images like we're going to talk about all of our things from a couple perspectives, from the technical perspective, from the design perspective, from a more general multimedia perspective, which includes, we're going to make some statements about images that apply to virtually all multimedia. All right? Probably the most basic fundamental one is, as the quality goes up, the file size goes up. That's true for images, and we'll make that point here, but that's sort of a general rule for anything. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. A better quality file is going to probably be a bigger file. So again, the balance between quality and speed of downloading. You as a designer have to figure it out. In addition, I want to talk about, for each multimedia element, how the multimedia elements work and play with the other things on the screen. All right? I showed an example a few classes back of this guy. I wonder who that guy actually is. Maybe he is a, a criminal fisherman that's running for Senate. I don't know. All right. But as you notice, what they do here is they go for a more expressive thing with their images and with their text. This would be a case where I would say where the images and the text resonate with each other. All right. What I mean by resonate is they complement each other. All right? We have an outdoorsy looking picture and we have outdoorsy looking font. 
We have a very official criminal lawbreaker picture, and we have the font to match it, likewise with the campaign poster. So that's one thing that's often done, is that we take and we match the images with our text. So the text and the images give the same feeling. Now, that's good, but that's not the only way. Sometimes it's good when the text and the images, or really any two multimedia elements, don't complement each other, but actually give different messages. Can anyone think of an example of that? Where you might have text and images that say different things, but that's effective. There's an example I was looking for in one of my books, and I, I couldn't find it. So I, I attempted to recreate it by taking a couple pictures off the internet and uh, putting a caption on it. Let's take a look at this. doing a public service announcement for drug awareness. All right. These people are not actually criminals. I guess they're actors on a TV show. I don't know which one. I just downloaded them in a minute before. But we have a post that would say, spot the drug dealer. All right. In this case, the image and the text complement each other because these people look like the stereotype that you would have of a drug dealer. All right? So you have some fairly rough looking guys and you have a caption about drug dealers. So that would be a way of making the text and the image go together. But is that necessarily the best way to make the point? All right? I saw an old poster that looked something like this. Again, I don't have the exact copy so I recreated it. That I thought was way more effective. And it looked like this spot the drug dealer. And what they have instead is four or five look, looking, or five or six looking, you know, just average, typical, you wouldn't think of them as being drug dealers. And I think that makes a much better point, you know. It shows that, hey, you know, looks don't mean any, uh, don't mean everything all the time. That, you know, don't stereotype and say because this person looks this way, they're a drug dealer, this person looks that way, they're a clean cut person. So, by doing this, it removes sort of the stereotypical aspect from it and saying, you know, anyone could be doing this. You don't know just by looking at the person what they are. And another point that this raises is the way a lot of kids get into drugs is through just their regular old friends. All right. So in this case, the picture and the text at first don't look like they belong together. All right. Uh, this would be a form of, of, I guess, what you call irony. Right? Because the picture doesn't look like drug dealers, but that's quite the point. All right? Why do you think something like this is more effective than taking the easy way and having the picture and the text match each other? Any thoughts? Why would something like this be more effective? When someone sees it, they have to think more. Exactly. On the lower one. Yeah, exactly. It creates a little what they call cognitive dissonance where you see two things that don't add up in your head. That's, that's a little disorienting for you. That's a little bit of a, a shock to your brain. And your brain has to stop and think about what's being said. Well, as someone creating a public service announcement or an advertisement, gee, that's kind of a goal, isn't it? To have people stop and think about what it is. With the other image, you could go on and just keep having those stereotypes in your head and, and never learn anything from that public service announcement. All right? With this, you stop and you think about it, and you, you can think about the intent of the message, and you can figure it out. It's just a case of something that sort of jolts you a little bit. Here's some other examples from this book. All right, here's two of them. One is a Volkswagen with the word 11 underneath it. You know, you would never think a car company would call their own car a lemon, right? A, a bad car. So that catches your attention. Gee, is Volkswagen admitting their cars aren't very good? But when you read the paragraph, 
it explains it and it all makes sense. It's a good attention grabber. This is a very powerful one against drunk driving, one for the road, and it shows someone who lost their leg apparently in a, a drunk driving accident. So it's a case of the one for the road, you know, is something that is typically said when, you know, people are out having a night on the town, and yet the image is something that doesn't complement that at all. Now, as always, when you do something like that, there's benefits of it and there's disadvantages of, of it. What are the benefits of taking this sort of approach, this sort of ironic approach? I think we talked about them a little bit, that, that it, it can really grab your attention because people will see it and will wonder what on earth do they mean by that. And it will draw attention to it and allow people to think about it. What's some of the danger of doing this? What's the danger of putting text and images that kind of don't match together? This might not be a good example. Think of a Volkswagen ad with lemon. People might not read the rest of it. Yeah, people might not get it. You know, you always got to be careful when you're being ironic or using sarcasm or anything like that because especially on a medium like the web, they can't hear the tone of voice that you have. I mean, how many of you have ever sent an email to someone that they took the wrong way simply because they couldn't hear your voice saying that, that you were joking about something but because it was just in text? That's why people use emoticons, right, to say, you know, hey, you, you know, you can't see my face, but I'm winking when I'm saying this, or I'm smiling, or I'm laughing, or whatever. So there's always, a, there's always a possibility that if you take an approach like this, if people don't get it, they'll get the exact opposite wrong idea. All right? So if someone looked at this ad from Volkswagen and didn't bother to take the time to read about that, or if they weren't thinking in those terms, they're liable to think, Oh, this is an ad from Consumer Reports telling me not to buy Volkswagens. All right, better not buy one. All right. The other thing about this is a little of this goes a long way. All right. If you beat your user over the head with this sort of thing, all right, um, it, it becomes tiresome very quickly. You know, a little bit of this goes a long way. You know, and. Again, that sort of gets on the simplicity versus complexity argument, right? To have your text and your image match up and line up and resonate with each other is certainly more simple than to make them contrast, all right? But if you make them contrast, you can be even more expressive. But again, the, one of the downsides of that is the danger of overkill with it. If you do it too much, you beat people over the head and, and it's overkill and you end up losing the message. Uh, that you intended. Can anyone think of other examples where they've seen this? Maybe not necessarily between text and print, but maybe within a movie or TV commercial or anything like that. I'm trying to, there's one I have in mind. Um, see if you have any that you can think of. Try to pay attention for this. All right, as you're watching. Just like we said in the movie, you know, you never notice how much they use that font until you, you care about it. Um, you might be surprised, like, if you're watching TV and they show commercials, you know, are there any commercials that do something like this, you know? Um, the one example I can think of from a movie is, has, everyone, has anyone seen the movie Good, uh, Good Morning Vietnam? All right, a few years, several years back, probably, I don't know. They play uh, Louis Armstrong singing uh, It's a Wonderful World as they're showing scenes of war, all right? So somehow that's much more touching than if you played uh, a, you know, a, a, a really harsh metal song with scenes of war in the background, all right? Or if you played the nice It's a Wonderful World song with nice kids playing on a swing in the background. You know, the contrast between that, really point out in your head, gee, it could be a wonderful world if folks stopped doing this kind of thing, all right? And again, it made the point, and again, I, they, they made it very clearly, and I think it was done effectively. Because again, it wasn't, 
weren't beat over the head with it. It was, it was used, it was well thought out, and it was used appropriately. So if you get a chance, uh, look that up. Look that clip up uh, on YouTube, um, and you should, should be able to see it. All right. I want to talk about images and specifically editing images. All right. When we talk about images, all right, we're talking about any sort of graphics, whether they be um, photographs or drawings. All, right? all of those fall under the category of images, so think of those as interchangeable. Simply put, there's two sorts of kinds of graphic files. All right? There are vector files. And there are what are called bitmap uh, or raster files. Okay, let's try to explain the difference. And this is important. Vector graphics are typically used in like gaming, gaming production, or like in flash animation. Vector graphics are used. Whereas most typical images are bitmaps. What's the difference between a bitmap and a uh, vector image? Now, this should not be confused with a BMP file, which is a Microsoft bitmap, all right? Because actually, JPEGs, GIFs, BMPs, PNGs, are all example of bitmap files. All right, it's a case of one word being used for two different things. Maybe that's why people, when they refer to these, refer to them as raster. All right. Now, if you look at a screen, screen is a collection of little dots. And I'm not going to sit in here and fill in all of those. All right? Thank goodness. Let's, let's imagine where we got a, a little magnifying glass up against this. And let's say that this is what the screen looks like. Make a small little grid. Each one of these represents a pixel, all right? So if we were going to make an oval using this, we might do something like this. We might, let's say we make a black oval. We might do something like this. We might have a file that would say that these pixels have a color and the other pixels are blank. And if you looked at that, if the drawing was better, that would kind of look like an oval. All right? Not really, but, but kind of. In bitmap images, essentially, they're a grid of values that says what the status, what the color, if you will, of each and every pixel is. So they'd be in a file. Some representation of white, 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 black, 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 white, 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 black, white, 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 and so on down the line. That would be stored digitally. All right? Now, how many colors there are depend on how many bits that we have. All right? Bits are numbers that are just 0 or 1, binary digits, bits. This would be sort of a one-bit color scheme. Right? Maybe one meant black and zero meant white. All right? But then if we wanted to get other colors in there, we'd have to have different combinations of things. When we talk about, like one of the things in video games you hear, for example, is 8-bit. All right? 8-bit graphics. 8-bit graphics, you have a total of eight binary digits. That means that you have 
2 to the 8th power number of colors, which would be 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, that's 16. That would be 256 colors. Because every one of these 8 bits, or 8 binary digits, could be a 0 or 1. And if you counted up all the combinations of that, that would be one combination. This might be another. Each one of those represents a color, and there's 256 color combinations you can have, all right? And therefore, there's 256 different colors you can have. Well, 256 colors isn't a lot of colors. You might think it is, like you might think, well, gee, I got by on the eight crayon box of crayons when I was a kid, so 256, that's a lot. If you take a photo of something, doesn't matter what it is, you know, even my shirt, the way that the shadows hit my shirt and the, just the slight different fading of the color of the shirt, because this is an old shirt, and all that thing, means that in, just in my shirt, even though it looks pretty simple, there's a lot of colors, all right? So what they do is they go up. There can be then 16-bit. And 16-bit would be 256 times 256, which it is too early to do that kind of math, all right? I'm um, thinking 6 million, but I'm not sure. No, 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 that would be like 65,000, I think, and change. Well, that's starting to be quite a lot of colors. If you add a third set of 8 bits, then you have a whole lot, and so on. Now, here's the interesting thing, because we're going to talk about the same thing when we talk about audio, all right? Because we're going to represent, instead of colors, we're going to represent sounds. So the more bits we have in the sound, the more variation we can store and the more accurate and, and the more complete we can, we can store the music, all right, or whatever audio, all right? Now, in a Microsoft BMP file, we literally store a value, one byte, I think, One byte for each pixel. All right? So if we went and made a BMP file, we would, uh, you know, it would take up, you know, we could figure out how big it would be based on the width times the length. Let's do that. Let's go into the simplest of all image editors, Microsoft Paint, and make a bitmap image. All right, here I am in paint. Yeah, not there yet. Okay, here I am, and I'm going to make a draw like a circle. All right. So there I have, I have a red circle. I'm going to go and save this. I'm going to save it as a BMP file. And again, notice I have a number of choices. I have a monochromatic bitmap. Monochromatic means what? One color. I have a 16-color bitmap that would store for each, um, that, that would store a total of, of um, 16 colors, which means it would use half a byte, or four bits for each one. I then have a color bitmap of 256 colors. That would be using one byte, or eight bits for it. So that's kind of the example I was showing up there. So I'll save that. I'll save it as a 256-color as a bitmap. And let me save it on the desktop, and we'll call it circle, maybe. Now, 
Now, it warned me that the colors may be reduced. Why was that? Because it can only store 256 colors. It only has 256 crayons in its crayon.